as you probably know, there's been a lot of research recently trying to understand how the brain works, and in particular, the types of computations it might perform. A new hypothesis has emerged. The brain might be working like a probabilistic machine. At the origin of this idea is the recognition that we live in a world of uncertainty. Our environment is often ambiguous or noisy, and our sensory receptors are limited. Often, multiple interpretations are possible. In this context, the best our brain can do is to try to guess what's present in the world and what best action to take. Hermann von Helmholtz is often credited for understanding this. Studying the human eye, von Helmholtz judged it to be a very imperfect optical instrument. He then proposed that visual perception resulted from what he called the process of unconscious inference. Through this automatic process, the brain would be able to complete missing information using previous information and construct hypotheses about the world. These hypotheses would then be automatically accepted as our immediate reality. The brain would be a very sophisticated guessing machine. This idea has been formalized in recent years, taking ideas from machine learning and statistics. It is proposed that the brain works by constantly forming hypotheses or beliefs about the environment and the actions to take. Those hypotheses can be described mathematically as conditional probabilities, denoted P of the hypothesis given the data, which means the probability of the hypothesis given the data, where data represents the signals available to our senses. For example, suppose you are trying to figure out whether it's going to rain today. The data available might be the dark clouds that you can observe by the window. Statisticians have shown that the best way to compute those probabilities is to use Bayes' rule, named after Thomas Bayes. Bayes' rule states that we can get the probability P of the hypothesis given the data, which we call the posterior probability, by multiplying two other probabilities. First, P of the data given the hypothesis. Our knowledge about the probability of the data given the hypothesis. For example, how probable is it that the clouds look the way they do now when you actually know it is going to rain, which is called the likelihood, times P of the hypothesis, which we call the prior probability. This represents our knowledge about the hypothesis before we collect any new information. Here, for example, the probability that it's going to rain in a day independently of the shape of the cloud, a number which would be very different whether you live in Edinburgh or Los Angeles. The denominator, P of the data, is only there to ensure the resulting probability is comprised between 0 and 1 and can often be disregarded in the computation. In the visual system, in the same way, the hypothesis could be about the presence of a given object, for example, there's an animal following me, or the value of a given stimulus, for example, the speed of this animal is 30 km per hour, while the data is the noisy visual inputs. The prior and the likelihood form an internal model of the world, a model of the world inside the brain, which is used to interpret our external environment. So how can we test if the brain is doing something like Bayesian inference? This has been the focus of a lot of experimental and theoretical research in the last 15 years. A first test is to look at how the brain combines information from different sensory modalities. Suppose, for example, that you are walking in a forest and fear that someone or an animal is following you. You can dimly see and hear some movement of the leaves on the ground. How do you figure out where the animal is located? Do you use one sensory modality more than the other? For example, only vision or both? How does this depend on the reliability of the information available to each of the senses? Bayesian inference predicts that the optimal way to do this is to combine information from both modalities, but weighting the information according to its reliability. For example, if the visual information is much clearer than the auditory information, it should have much more impact on your experience. This can lead to illusions in situations where there is a conflict between the two modalities. In a lot of situations, it seems that the Bayesian predictions are qualitatively correct. Have a look at this. Ba, 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 ba. But now, look what happens if we change the video. Ba, 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 ba. What do you hear? 
ba, 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 ba. The sound has not changed. Ba, 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 ba. This effect is known as the McGurk effect. It was discovered by accident. McGurk and his research assistant MacDonald were conducting a study on language perception in infants. They asked a technician to dub the sound of a phoneme over a video that was showing lips movement for another phoneme. Even if we know about this effect, we continue perceiving da. This shows that our brain automatically and unconsciously combines the visual and, and the auditory information in our perception of speech, creating a new mixture that might be very different from the initial sources of information. Sometimes though, if the visual information is much more reliable than the auditory information, it can completely dominate our perceptual judgments. This can be seen in the compelling illusion of ventriloquism. Ventriloquism is a case of visual capture. Because the origin of the sound is uncertain, but the lips and expression of the puppet can be clearly perceived, one attributes the origin of the sound to the visual inputs, that is to the mouth of the puppet. So in everyday life, the brain combines information from different modalities in a way that depends on their uncertainty. In the laboratory, researchers can make very precise measurements to test the validity of the Bayesian prediction. For example, they can measure the smallest differences one can perceive when comparing the size of different objects, based on vision alone or touch alone. And then compare the predictions of the Bayesian model with performance when both vision and touch can be used simultaneously. Such experiments have found that human participants behave in a way very similar to the Bayesian predictions, and have concluded that human performances are statistically optimal. These results are commonly interpreted as showing that the brain works in a way similar to a Bayesian machine. The Bayesian model predicts not only how to combine different pieces of information, but also how to incorporate prior knowledge. Such prior knowledge should be combined in terms of a prior distribution, which serves as a summary of all previous experience and which should be multiplied with incoming information. Recently, a lot of researchers are exploring this idea. If the brain uses prior beliefs, what are those? And how do they influence perception? Intuitively, it's in situations of strong uncertainty or ambiguity that we rely maximally on our previous experience. For example, if we wake up in the middle of the night and need to walk in total darkness, we are going to rely on our previous experience of the environment to guide our path. Similarly, Bayes' rule indicates that prior distributions should impact our perception maximally in situations of strong uncertainty. Therefore, a very good way to look at the brain's expectations of us, or assumptions is to look at these situations of strong uncertainty. Such studies reveal that our brains make assumptions all the time. I am the same height here as I am over here. But here, I look much taller. How does that work? When trying to estimate size, you make the assumption that the room is cubic and the ceiling is parallel to the floor. This assumption makes sense because most rooms are designed this way. But here, this is not the case. The room is actually trapezoidal and the ceiling is not parallel to the floor. The reality that we perceive is consistent with our expectations, but not with the actual physical world. We make such assumptions all the time. For example, we expect that light comes from above us and interpret shadows as such. Objects to be symmetrical, to change smoothly in space and time, orientations to be more frequently horizontal or vertical, and angles to look like perpendicular corners. We also expect objects to bulge outward more than inward, that background images are colored in a uniform way, that objects move slowly or not at all, that the gaze of other people is directed towards us, and that faces correspond to convex surfaces. This is illustrated by this classical illusion known as the hollow mask illusion. What you see here is a concave mask of the face of Albert Einstein, that is the interior of the mask. However, we perceive it as a convex face with the nose bulging outward instead of inward. Our expectations that faces bulge outward is so strong that it counters 3D cues and depth cues. As for the McGurk effect, knowing about the illusion doesn't help. The interpretation chosen by the brain is automatic and unconscious and can't be modulated voluntarily. Why would the brain use such assumptions? These assumptions make sense because most objects in the world conform those expectations. Light comes from above, 
noses always stick out, objects are often static or move slowly. In that sense, using these assumptions, we lead to the best guess about the environment, and we can think about them as being optimal. However, in situation of strong uncertainty, or when the objects don't conform the average statistics, using these expectations can lead to illusions. We will then tend to perceive reality as being more similar to what we expect than it really is. Objects will be seen as being slower, more symmetrical, or maybe smoother in space and time, etc. The Bayesian approach helps formalizing these ideas in a quantitative way. The idea has emerged that visual illusions were not due to the limitations of a collection of imperfect hacks that the brain would use, but rather to the result of a coherent computational strategy that is optimal under reasonable assumptions. For some researchers, because they correspond to the brain making very sensible assumptions in a situation of uncertainty, visual illusions could be viewed, paradoxically, as optimal percepts. A lot of very important questions remain. Where do those prior beliefs come from? How do we learn them? Are they the same for everybody? How do they depend on our previous experience? And can we unlearn, for example, that light shines from above or that noses stick outward and not inward? Such questions are the focus of current research. Experimental work shows that our brains create prior expectations automatically and unconsciously all the time. We collect information about our, our environment and try to use it to predict what could come next. Current work also shows that our brain can update even its more natural assumptions, such as the assumption that light comes from above. This shows that our brain constantly revises its assumptions and updates its internal model of the world. The idea that the brain would work like a probabilistic machine is not restricted to perception, but has been applied to all domains of cognition. In particular, Bayesian models could be very useful for psychiatry. It's very early days for understanding mental illness. However, recent research shows that Bayesian models could be very useful for quantifying differences between groups, for example, patients versus controls, and for understanding whether those differences come from different internal models, for example, different prior beliefs, or differences in learning or decision strategies. Ultimately, this may help drug discovery. In the study of schizophrenia, for example, recent work shows that patients differ from controls in some probabilistic inference tasks. One such task is called the BEADS task. In this task, you have two jars. One jar contains 85% green beads and 15% blue beads. In the other jar, there are 85% blue beads and 15% green beads. Your task is to tell me from which jar come the beads that I'm drawing at random. So now I'm going to cover the jars, mix them, and I'm going to draw a bead at a time from the same jar. Your task is to tell me when you think you have received enough information to tell me from which jar those beads come from. Now, need one more bead. Another one. Or can you decide now? Schizophrenic patients are more likely than controls to make a decision after a very small number of observations, like one or two draws and to report being certain about their decision after only one draw. This tendency to jump to conclusions is thought to be crucial for understanding delusions in paranoia. Researchers use mathematical models of decision tasks like this to understand patients' decision processes. A common idea in psychiatry is also that the internal models used by patients, in particular their prior beliefs or expectations, could be different from those of healthy subjects, or maybe too strong or too weak. This could explain why the patients experience the world differently. Ultimately, Bayesian modeling might also help diagnosis. Mental illness is usually measured using questionnaires or classifications such as DSM-5, which is used by clinicians and psychiatrists. Computational modeling coupled with behavioral measurements such as in the bead task or other games offer a different way to quantify differences between patients and LC controls and the internal beliefs people's brains are working with. So finally, you must be wondering how our brain can do the sophisticated computation. Bayesian models are very useful for describing perception and behavior at the computational level, as Mark explained. How those algorithms are implemented in the brain is still very unclear. 
In fact, it is still quite debated whether Bayesian models can make predictions for neurobiology in terms of which areas of the brain would be involved and how Bayes' rule or the terms of these equations would be implemented. But this is the focus of current research.